to Eye on Horror, the official podcast of iHorror.com. This is episode 106, otherwise known as season six, episode seven. I am your host, James J. Edwards, and with me, as always, is your other host, Jacob Davison. How are you doing, Jacob? Uh, doing good. Uh, just still kind of waking up. I was at a midnight show, Beyond the Black Rainbow, last night at the New Beverly. How, uh, how many times have you seen Beyond the Black Rainbow? Uh, you know, I actually have my letterbox here. And I think about seven, say seven or eight times. Is that more or less than Mandy? Did you even need to ask that question? I'm pretty sure <laughs> we already know the answer. Uh, actually, I think I've seen Mandy slightly less. Like, I think I've only seen that about six or seven times. And yeah, I think Beyond the Black Rainbow maybe is so. But but Beyond the Black Rainbow has been out longer. So but that's that's true, too. I was actually at the uh, uh, initial release screening back in summer of 2012. Oh. Changed my life forever. <laughs> uh, also with us, as always, is your other other host, John Korea. How you doing, Korea? Uh, I am. I am sunsick from being at the Ren Fair all day yesterday, and I took a sip from my drink from the Ren Fair yesterday, uh, thinking it was just water and mio. Um, but no, there's there's vodka in there. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, that was a that was a surprise. So starting the morning off great, guys. <laughs> Ye old mead. My uh, my wife once was working uh, a shift as a as a server at um at at this one bar, and uh, she grabbed a bottle of water to bring with her for her shift, and she grabbed a bottle of water that actually was a bottle of vodka in a water bottle. <laughs> Wow. And didn't find out until she went to take a swig of it while she was working. She's like, Ugh. <laughs> Ugh. Just having horrible, horrible flashbacks to college. We're just like, I'm so thirsty. Need to drink. Ugh. No, no, that's just straight vodka. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that that probably ruined that shift because because not only did she not want to drink, she also had no water. Um, we've uh, we haven't there hasn't been a lot that's come out uh, since last time we talked. But last time we talked, we kind of ran out of time uh because there was so much so let's get on with it um and let's find out what jacob saw at salem fest at the salem horror fest yeah oh yeah let's, no, let's I take saw... a step back and see, did you see anything good there oh yeah no i saw tons of great movies at salem horror fest and uh I was, and i should add that uh i was fortunate enough to get a short into the festival uh the october martyr is the name of the short uh it's on the festival circuit now uh i i wrote it and co-produced it and it was directed and co-produced by uh robert teamstra and we both went to uh salem mass to see it play and uh being from the area uh you know i was able to crash at my dad's and i was able to stay for both weekends uh, but yeah, no, there, there were a lot of great movies um, like right off the bat. One of my personal favorites was this uh, documentary called Satan Wants You, which uh, for those of you familiar with the uh, satanic panic of the uh, 70s through the 80s was um, about the uh, Michelle Remembers story, uh, you know, that novel or, or that uh, true, true story about uh, in air quotes about uh, this woman who said that she was held captive by a satanic cult. And it's kind of what kicked off uh, the mass hysteria. I was about to say biggest air quotes yeah. ever around true story. He was air quoting it. Um, and I'm glad that he mentioned that he was air quoting yeah. it because we can't yeah, see him. I always, yeah. <laughs> I always forget the uh, limitations of this audio uh, medium. <laughs> but well, yeah, John, you, you know, you know about Michelle remembers, right? Oh, I have a I have a first pressing right next to me, actually, oh, on my shit. bookshelf. It is the most cursed object I own because, um, <laughs> well, because Michelle remembers is supposedly this adult woman who was doing a form of therapy of regret of bringing up regressed and suppressed memories. Um, and supposedly through that, she was re her name was Michelle and she was remembering. So it's not just a clever name. <laughs> no, it's her supposedly remembering being a child, being raped and tortured by the satanic cult in their basement for years. All bullshit um, and extremely dangerous because it not only made people think that satanic cults are a thing like that, but also that doing that form of therapy was 
ethical. It's not. It's not an accepted form of therapy, especially nowadays. But even then, it was questionable, but it was definitely sensationalized. So it was basically like the therapy equivalent of exorcism, real life exorcisms, where it's like, yeah, no, it's great for movies. It's great for entertainment. But like putting it into practical use is fucking horrible. And it led to a lot of re- it, it led to this. That book was like what was like the spark. It was the keystone to the satanic panic. Like it, it became cited yeah. by uh, police, by ministers, by uh, doctors as yeah. proof that again, air quotes uh, that, you know, there were, there was a conspiracy of Satanists just running around doing all this crazy shit in the country. And, and the documentary does a good job of uh, kind of disseminating uh you know, just kind of breaking down how, uh, you know, this one book kind of led to a lot of that. And also it went into a lot of the shady shit surrounding uh, the book's publication because uh, it turned out the book was subsidized by the Catholic Church. Like they paid the guy ten thousand dollars. That sounds about right. Cree, if you, if you ever want to add to your cursed objects uh, collection, I have a first edition hardback of the Amityville Horror. Oh, <laughs> I'm all set. <laughs> I'm all set. I think that would. That would Is cause that too much. If I touch it, it'll <laughs> cause me to start burning. Um, but oh, no, it, it led to a lot of things. There was a whole movement during in the during the satanic panic where they were going after preschools because they were saying that these that and the problem with this form of therapy because you're putting them under hypnosis, you're putting them under all these things. There's a lot of suggestion that's happening there. So that's it, what happened it, with like McMartin, the McMartin preschool. It's exactly. Like that that yeah. was the case they cited in the movie. Yeah, yeah. They, they were basically programming these kids to 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 testify that there was like this satanic rituals in the basement of this yep. <laughs> of this preschool. Yeah, that was a messed up case. There's a bunch of cases with it where it was like, oh, yeah, they did all this stuff in the basement. That fucking building never had a base. <laughs> yeah. It it was in fact they did a parallel of the satanic panic stuff in the eighties with the QAnon and PizzaGate stuff yeah. today. You know, it's like oh. it, everything old is new again. Yeah. yeah, the PizzaGate place didn't have a basement either. Nope. But yeah, if you want to get more into like the the witch hunt into preschools, especially like MacArthur and all those, uh, there's a book called Satan Silence: Ritual Abuse and the Making of a Modern American Witch Hunt. Uh, it's absolutely phenomenal. They do really deep dives. Uh, Debbie Nathan uh, co-wrote it with Michael uh, Snedecker. I'm going to, my apologies for butchering that last name, but um, Debbie uh, Debbie Nathan is an amazing uh, journalist. She also uh, wrote uh, uh, the book Sybil Exposed, um, which is another great uh, read. Uh, Sybil was the um, person that had multiple personality syndrome and was like one of the big cases for that. Um who uh and like it led to the like movie sybil um is that sally field that was yeah the the sally field movie yeah but there's read sybil exposed i don't want to i don't want to spoil <laughs> a lot but like that story is very fucking interesting it involves a it, it, basically like it, there's a possibility that sybil was faking it but was like faking it because she was in love with her uh therapist and uh who, which she did not reciprocate but like, so she kept like the thing going because they were making a lot of money off it. It's it's very interesting. But yeah, Civil Expose is another great one. Uh, basically, if you did anything by Debbie Nathan, she's she's also doing some great work uh, at the border right now, writing about what's going on there. Uh, but yeah, no, th- that was just opening night. Like th- I saw a lot of other great movies at Salem Horror Fest. Um, in, ter- in terms of narratives, uh, some of my favorite feature films were uh, Stag by Alexandra Spieth. Uh, which was basically about uh, a woman who's been disconnected by like an old friend of hers gets unexpectedly invited to a bachelorette party at an isolated campsite. And consi- and also uh, my sister had a uh, summer camp destination wedding. So I, I really related to this one and I thought it was very funny and uh, did a, did a good job of playing with uh, uh, the genre and uh I also was a big fan of uh, Tea Blockers by Alice uh, McKay, which uh, was about uh, when ancient parasites rise from beneath a small town, taking the most fearful and susceptible as hosts. A young trans filmmaker finds herself the only one who can sense possessed and rally the resistance before the horror escapes and spreads. Uh, very topical. And uh, Alice McKay has been uh, really been jumping to the forefront in horror. And she's already got another couple movies lined up and, uh, yeah, no, just it 
it, it was it was great to see on the big screen. Uh, let's see. That sound that T blocker sounds right up my alley because I'm right in the middle of reading Manhunt right now. I don't know if you guys have. Oh heard. yeah, I know that one. Oh man, it's such a great book. Uh, it's it's uh yeah, this would make a great companion piece to that. It, it would. Okay, yeah. If you don't know Manhunt, check it out. Post apocalyptic New England where uh, a virus has turned everyone with testosterone into murdering, raping like monsters uh they're called new men and so you follow these two uh trans women who are like fighting to stay alive because as their estrogen wears if their estrogen wears off they start to become new men and then you have turfs which are basically like mad max villains hunting them down because they think they're all uh that trans women are ticking time bombs and it's absolutely phenomenal and i want TV adaptation. I want video games based on. I want everything. This book is it's brutal as fuck. Uh, Manhunt. Oh, we're ha- we're getting. I'm getting into a little book corner over here, guys. Yep, John Johnny's <laughs> book co- corner. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. Uh, I was also a big fan of this uh, micro budget horror movie called Brightwood by Dane Elkar, which is about uh, a couple that are kind of going through some dysfunction going for a jog around a pond and they get stuck in this kind of time loop and shit goes bananas uh which again you know is things something i really appreciate about salem horror fest because like uh the majority share of these movies were uh independent uh micro budget so it just really goes to show what f- these what filmmakers can do you know uh trying to uh, make the, these big ideas uh, with limited resources. That's one of my favorite genres is like low, low budget, but like high concept, like primer or um, who's the, the Texas duo Benson and Moorhead. Uh, oh yeah. Guys, yeah. The and, kings of that. <laughs> and, and also there was this uh, wild animated movie called the weird kids uh, animated and directed by Zach Passero, which, which he made over the course of several years. Uh, and it was produced by Lucky McKee. And it's basically this kind of monster squad, uh, Goonies uh, type of horror comedy about uh, these uh, three preteens who go with like their uh, friend's older brother to go out to the desert. And there's a monster on the loose. And it just it goes pretty wild from there. Uh, so very excited for when that comes out. And also a big shout out to a lot of shorts. uh like I saw a lot of great and amazing shorts by some uh, talented filmmakers while I was at Salem Horror Fest, including Blank by Abishai Weinberger, which involved a uh, relationship uh, that goes into crisis when uh, a woman starts to slowly lose her mind. Uh, also, Baby Fever by Hannah Mae Cumming about a popular teen who wants to become prom, prom queen who discovers she's uh, pregnant, but there's a lot more to what she's pregnant with and uh, uh, the house sitters, which is about uh, a couple of best friends uh, is directed by Sydney Horton. Uh, yeah. It's about a couple of best friends who uh, house sit uh, for uh, their grandmother and uh, weird stuff starts to happen. They think the house may be haunted, but at the same time, somebody may be after them. Oh, and uh, the Five Fingers of, of a Dog by uh, Charlie Compton and Justin Landsman, which was a kind of a giallo throwback that was shot uh, in and around Boston. And that's a giallo name. <laughs> yeah, it really is. They they and they really captured the um, the aesthetic and style and the bloodshed. And uh, also, they had a kick-ass poster uh, made by uh, Trevor Henderson, Slimy Swamp Ghost, and. Yeah, no, it's again, you know, it's just I love this kind of festival because, you know, I get to see so many shorts and films uh, just, you know, outside the mainstream and outside of uh, the common parameters. So, you know, it's like there's so many talented filmmakers and and crew and casts and, yeah, you know, just, uh, you know, hoping to see more from them in the future. I haven't seen a whole lot of new stuff since last time we talked, but one thing I did see and I'm curious if either you guys have gotten to it yet because it's kind of. Got a lot of hype on the internet. Have either of you guys gotten to Soft and Quiet yet? Uh, oh. No. I have- it's on Netflix. And um, if you don't know anything about it, don't read anything about it. Um, just go in. And the only thing I knew about it going in was that it takes place in real time. It's like a one-shot you know, movie. 
and and it's about 90 minutes long so it's basically one well it gives the illusion of being one continuous 90 minute shot um but the thing is there's there's a reveal that happens in the first act that is it's masterful the way that they pull it off and it's better if you don't know anything going into it and it was it was so well played that when the movie was over i watched the first probably 10 minutes before just to because i started thinking after the reveal i'm like oh you know what you know there's stuff that happened that tips you off to this and then i went back and i watched it and i was like oh man no this is like it's just masterfully revealed but um it's uh it's a really uncomfortable unsettling movie but it's it's powerful it's and it's it's really well executed i'll have to check that one out there's a lot of people been talking about it on the internet and i think a lot of people are saying too much when they say you know even saying what it is quote about air quotes (laughs) about is giving away a little too much about it but it's um it's it's a pretty shocking movie all right. Well, definitely going to put that on the watch list. I was about to say, man, I'd have to pop that in today while recovering on the couch. Yeah, uh, it's a, <laughs> it's a, I mean, it, it's not, I wouldn't say that you'll enjoy it, but it's definitely, you know, I mean, it's not the kind of movie that you enjoy, <laughs> right? Yeah. but it is, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it, it hits hard. <laughs> yeah. uh, also following up on last uh, episode, I did see polite society and yeah, John, you were 100 percent correct. That was awesome. Yeah. And it definitely had those kind of Edgar Wright vibes. Yeah, it's it's phenomenal. I can't wait to see what else uh, the these film, the, the team behind that make, because just high energy. Like I left that theater bouncing. Yeah. Oh, and yes. That's, and that's yeah, great. And, it, and oddly, it kind of reminded me of uh, those side scroller beat em up games like uh, Streets of Rage and yes. River City Ransom or River City Girls. Because, yeah, it does it does the kind of stuff where like they're just beating the crap out of each other and like throwing each other through walls and furniture. And I mean, they're kind of injured. They're kind of injured, but not like seriously injured. Yeah, they they went double dragon quite a few times. In yeah, the that was pretty good. Uh, yeah, no, it, it's it's really good. Uh, and I, I wanted at least it. two sequels, right? Um, I've been playing a little bit of catch up with some of my blues. So I finally got to watch uh, Benson and Moorhead's something in the dirt, uh, which is, I, it was really good. It, it's, it's, it's Benson and Moorhead and it's just great. Um, just see, I highly recommend getting the Blu-ray disc because the behind the scenes is great. And also it has two Q and A's. One is, uh, with them and Mike Flanagan, which is really phenomenal. And then there's another one with them and LP from run, uh, run the jewels. Um, which those that's two very different uh discussion curators, <laughs> Mike Flanagan and LP. So that's very interesting. But uh, both were phenomenal. But yeah, it's 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 really great, and it, they really captured that spirit of like, all right, because they made the movie during lockdown, and so most of the crew was literally just Benson and Moorhead and their producer. Um, they had people helping on the from the outside and stuff but for the most part in the apartment it was just the three of them doing all the lighting doing all the scripting doing all the acting all the directing do camera audio all that so it's yeah it's 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 really good and and uh it's a real love letter to la but not like hollywood la but like la la uh i don't, I don't know if you ever been to if you ever been to la and stayed away from the tourist thing or you're from there you'll understand what i'm talking about it's uh it's really good um I also at the uh, spooky swap meet that happened the other day uh, a couple weeks ago. I got a VHS of. Have you guys heard of Hider in the House? Oh yeah, the Gary Busey movie. I was gonna say it's Gary Busey, right? Yeah, I yeah. had never heard of this movie, and I was like, you know what? For two dollars, I'm buying this VHS. And let me tell you, that movie is. The premise is <laughs> Gary Busey is a is a grown man who suffered a lot of abuse as a child. And so he got really good at hiding. And at this point, he's just very he's uh, you know mentally disturbed and is going through things. But he goes, you know what? I want a house. So what he does is he goes into this house that no one has moved in yet. And he builds a fake wall in the attic and he's hiding in the house. He's the hider in the house. And he creates so like not just a clever name. <laughs> we are on fire with him today. <laughs> I need to address the name because the entire time I was watching, I was like, Hyder in the house is a terrible, awesome name, but there's got to be a better name for it. And so for 90 fucking minutes, I was sitting there going, what is a better name for this movie? And I came up with nothing. Nothing works better than (laughs) Hyder in the house. 
but it's phenomenal. I think it was like not long after his his accident, or or it was like right before. It was around that time. But like, I is read it a, a TV movie or is it a um? No, I think it just. Got, I think it was direct to video. Okay. I, I think it was meant to be theatrical, and then it got fucked on distribution. Uh, is what happened. But Gary Busey said that it was a uh, what he referred to as an NAR, a uh, non acting role. So that's just that's just Gary being Gary in those in those bits. <laughs> uh, and yeah, hider in the house, man. Oh uh, yeah, so he's hiding in the house. A family moves in. He falls in love with the with the mom, and like begins to like try to like win her over but like is also trying to not reveal that he's been like secretly living in their house it's uh yeah if hider in the house if you i think he got a dvd release years ago and is like hard to find if you could find a way to watch hider in the house fucking do it what what a, what a great afternoon i mean it's i mean it's a great horror concept what if a, what if gary Busey was hiding in your house how does it pair with bad ronald Oh, I haven't seen Bad Ronald yet. You you know what? I discovered an amazing double feature, Cocaine Bear and Beast. Ooh, yeah, that, Ooh. I like the sound of that. They they pair very, very well together. Um, have you guys seen um, this new movie? Actually, I think it just hit Shudder um, called Consecration. Uh, no, well, what's uh, yeah. that about? It's Jenna Malone as... Um, she She's a, a woman whose brother is like a like a priest... And um, he supposedly has committed suicide, but she doesn't think it's suicide. So she goes to the convent where he died and she's investigating with the help of like this cop and this Vatican priest. She's investigating his his death. And it's um, I mean, it's it's a little clunky in its execution because it jumps around timeline wise and it goes back to the the 1600s, I think, where, it, you know, it, it's it's a little it, it it's it's not quite as graceful as it should be, but it does get to this point towards the end where it does kind of that saw thing that we were talking about with Charlie Clouser, where it like shows everything that happened before, but from a different angle. And you're like, oh, this is good. This is good. You know, the, the twist is actually pretty cool, but I, I wish that it, you know, it, it's about 90 minutes long. I wish it was about 10 minutes longer. So it could have explained a little more of some of the, some of the weird stuff, but, um, but the payoff to me was, was, was worth it. I mean, that when it gets to that little, cause it also throws back like the opening scene, it, it does that thing where, where it throws back to it in the final scene, you know, and, and, and it completely changes the way the whole scene looks. So it's a, uh, yeah, I think it's on shutter. Now I got it. It was on voodoo as a 99 cent rental. Um, so I got it on voodoo and then of course it showed up on shutter. So I blew 99 cents, but Hey, still not as bad as me with orphan first kill buying <laughs> it outright <laughs> for 25 bucks. And then it showing up on paramount the next yeah. day. Not that uh, bad. I, I'm not crying over 99 cents. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, as for me, uh, we actually did a big screening at the arrow theater honoring, uh, Robert England, as a part of the screening of his uh, the new documentary about him, uh, Icon, the Robert England story. And so we did a Robert England marathon, including Freddy vs. Jason, The Last Showing, Stay Hungry, Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors, then The Doc. And yeah, no, it was a solid lineup. And uh, yeah, a couple of those I hadn't seen before. Like, I, of course, seen Freddy vs. Jason. Uh, had not seen the last showing or stay hungry and uh, England himself uh, helped pro program uh, the marathon. So yeah, the last showing was interesting because it's very, very much a, a grounded kind of Hitchcock thriller where he, uh, where England plays this kind of uh, deranged uh, theater worker who's pissed off about film going from uh, film prints to digital. And he decides to make his own movie by manipulating people in the theater and Stay Hungry was uh, genuinely heartening, uh, like dramedy from the 70s by Bob Raffleson, where Jeff Bridges plays the scion to this uh, southern corporation. And he, and he has to try and buy this gym where Arnold Schwarzenegger works and Robert Anglin plays a guy that works at the gym and is uh, <laughs> he's Arnold Schwarzenegger's grease guy for greasing him up uh, for the flexing competitions. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, no. And the documentary was very interesting going into uh, England's career. Uh, 
because yeah, and you know, just you know, I, you know, everybody knows him as Freddie, but it's just it's so interesting to see you know kind of his career trajectory and just uh, hear a lot of people gush about him because yeah, he seems to be a genuinely nice, sweet guy. Was he there for the screening? Oh yeah, yeah, he did intros for uh, the uh, for Stay Hungry and Nightmare on Elm Street three, and he did the Q and A for the doc. And man, he was so charming. You know, I could listen to him talk for hours and hear all his anecdotes and stuff. Yeah, no, this he, it's, it's just, he's such a, he's such an interesting guy. And it, and that doc was co directed by uh, Christopher Griffiths, uh, the friend of the podcast, who of course was here for Pennywise, the story of it. You know, yes. So yeah, gonna have to. I think that's going to Screambox uh, later this year, right? The I doc? believe so. Yeah, yeah. I'd I'd recommend it uh, if you want to know about uh, everything Robert England. Who doesn't? Yeah, like I said, he's a fascinating guy. Uh, I finally got because um, I backed on Kickstarter a restoration of the 1911 Italian adaptation of Dante's Inferno called Le Inferno. Um, so I finally got my Blu-ray of it, and let me tell you, it was a great restoration because that's that's a tough cookie to to restore. That movie's well over a hundred years old at this point. Uh, I think it's a hundred and twelve years old now. Um, but it was it's phenomenal. If you're a big fan of uh, you know watching silent films, especially the works of like George Millet and whatnot, the uh, in camera um, effects they were able to pull off, and some of the imagery is really gnarly. Uh, there's a whole bit where they had like a headless body carrying its head and they had the shot of like the head screaming and it still looks good. It still looks, it still holds up great. Uh, and I really like that the Inferno really captured the heart of Dante's Inferno, where it's basically just two guys walking through layers of hell going, Oh fuck, that's fucked up on to the next layer. Oh man, that's fucked up. <laughs> Cause that's the whole book in it. Uh, just two philosophers going, man, this place sucks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, I, I did also watch Sisu, which let oh. me tell you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Love that feel movie. good movie of the year. <laughs> Sisu was incredible in all ways. I, I was sitting there. I was like, man, we are watching Captain Finland, the first Revenger here. Only they don't need they don't need performance enhancing drugs like Americans do. They just need that white knuckle grit. To... I saw a, a gif on the Internet of, I think, the scene where he's throwing mines at the soldiers because <laughs> yeah. it, it, it has someone made a gif of it because a mine comes flying out and then hits his helmet right with the trigger of the mine and it just blows him up. Is Boom. that is that I, how it, how it's, it looks? Yeah. It's one okay. bit, but yeah, it's it's great. I could watch that gif all day. I mean, yeah. I, <laughs> oh yeah, no, I was like gut laughing watching that movie in theaters. It was when like, I saw that, when I saw that little that little clip, I was like, this has to be the scene Jacob was talking about. <laughs> it's it's the the whole minefield scene, because like, yeah, it's it's basically this one guy being chased by a group of Nazis who have a tank. And very early on, it's like it's an open field, and then there's a minefield, and it's just like, how the fuck is he gonna get out of it here? And it just the tension of it is I I was white knuckled gripping the seats because I was just like, get the fuck out of there. Do get out of there. You can't take on a tank. And, you know, it, yeah. and that's early in the movie. It just keeps going. And oh, man, beautifully shot. Acting was phenomenal. Uh, it really sold a really grindhousey like feel. Uh, and when that movie was ridiculous, if you saw Rare Exports, it's a very similar vibe of just like ridiculousness but sold in such a beautifully told serious way that you that you accept it it's yeah sisu it's it's phenomenal uh it's already uh, very high up there on favorites of the year uh so yeah i i was also fortunate enough to attend a pre-screening of the boogeyman uh directed by rob savage Ooh, what'd you think uh i really dug it um you know i had read the Stephen King short story years ago. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things, you, you know, whenever somebody adapts a Stephen King short story to the big screen, uh, a lot of, a lot of different ways you can go about it, but I, I think they really found a way to, uh, you know, kind of keep the tension and horror of the original short while expanding upon it. Cause it's basically about um, this family that's dealing with the loss of their mother and, uh, the father's a psychiatrist and he's got like a teenage girl and like a younger daughter and 
Well, uh, there a boogeyman enters their life. <laughs> I don't want to go into too many details. You know, I don't want to spoil anything. But uh, yeah, there. Uh, that I, I, yeah, I don't mean to alarm you, but there, it, there's a boogeyman in the house. <laughs> so it's not just a clever name. Oh. I'm on nope. fire with that <laughs> one today. Uh, my, my screening of the boogeyman is Tuesday and I can't wait because you know, it's weird because it oh, has yeah. such a generic name. But then when you find out it's the Stephen King boogeyman, you're like, OK, now, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> now yeah, I no, think it, we're in. Yeah. And Savage really does a good job of kind of capturing uh, King's style with kind of incorporating the kind of uh, ground and kind of uh, familial drama and, you know, kind of uh, real world problems intersecting with supernatural evil. And this is it, the Rob Savage who did host and dash can, right? The very same. Yeah. OK, so th- this is kind of a a different kind of, I'm, I'm assuming it's a different kind of approach for him because, you know, host yeah, and dash narrative. cam. Yeah. Host and dash cam were just so like, you know, micro budget and bare bones. And this sounds a little more ambitious. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I would definitely recommend it. Uh, and also nobody, you know, shit on it just because it's PG-13. Like it's it's a solid horror movie. Give it a chance. Listen, I, I never shit on anything for being PG-13 because. Yeah. No, no. Hey, the most terrifying movies I've ever seen growing up was Ghost and Ernest Scared Stupid. So. Oh, yeah. I do not adhere to the it's not scary if it's right, if it's not rated R. You're talking to the guy who was scared by a hand on Sesame Street. OK, so that hand was terrifying. I know what <laughs> you're talking I about. I was yeah. talking about me. But did that scare you, too? That hand scared. the. Oh, shit yeah. That out the hand me. scared the hell out of me. <laughs> yeah. All three of us hate nightmares kinder that trauma. Hand. Or yeah. the ha- or the hands in a labyrinth. Like, yeah, come on. There's creepy. a lot of PG PG movies. Uh, what was the what was the one that Del Toro wrote uh, re- and produced a remake for um, the TV movie? Don't be afraid of the dark. Don't be afraid of the dark. All oh, right. Uh, come on. You just you need atmosphere uh, and you can you can accomplish that without dropping F bombs and blood and gore. And oh, yeah. Remember when TV movies were scary? I mean, yeah, those don't be afraid of the dark. Yeah, yeah. Night, don't be afraid dark of the night dark. of the scarecrow. Yeah, the scarecrow. Bad yeah. Ronald was Jaws R. Oh, no, that was PG. Yeah, Jaws was PG. Fuck everybody. Jaws was PG. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, I recommend uh, the boogeyman. And uh, James, interesting again, your thoughts when you see it. Yeah, I'll, I'm seeing it Tuesday. So next time we talk uh, with that, let's move on to our topic, which um, was inspired by Evil Dead Rise, which if you listen to our last episode, you know, we all loved. And oh, yeah. one of the things we loved about it was how seamlessly it transitioned from the creepy cabin in the woods to an urban setting in this high rise apartment. High rise I use loosely because I'm not sure how high rise it was, but it was at least there was an elevator. It was a tall <laughs> building, you know. Yeah. It was I mean, when you think high rise, you think of, you know, Empire State Building kind of a thing. But um we were thinking there are other horror franchises who have also taken the the urban approach. And I'm going to go first because I have a favorite and that is it went not once, but twice <laughs> Leprechaun in the hood and back to the yes. hood. Yes. And the thing with Leprechaun is Leps it's, it started on a farm and then it went, I think to LA, which LA you can kind of think is urban, but LA has kind of a suburban feel to it a lot of times. So well, it's great. It went to two cities of known for greed, right? LA and then well, the third one's Vegas. Yeah, Vegas. The third one, they went to Vegas. And then the fourth one, they went to space. I which, went to space. Where do you go after space? Joke. Yeah, you got to <laughs> go to space. And then finally he goes to the hood. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but the thing is, he didn't just go to the hood. He went back. <laughs> to the hood with a numerical two. Yeah. Yep. Oh, and man. if you haven't seen the last, the, well, I, I say the last two, but there actually have been a couple since then. But if you haven't seen Lep in the Hood or Back to the Hood, I, you really need to because, first of all, Lep raps. Yeah, the Leprechaun rap theme song. It's great. Warwick Davis rapping is great. Yeah. <laughs> the, the whole thing about the first, about Lep in the Hood is, um, Ice T has this flute that he took from Leprechaun, <laughs> and it makes him this um, this <laughs> successful record producer. Oh my god, dude, you're laughing, and it's a funny concept. How can you not laugh at? So Ice T has this magical flute that he stole from <laughs> a magical a Leprechaun. leprechaun flute. 
Like I forgot about like I I mainly only just remember the behind the scenes of Work Davis learning how to hit a bog. Like yeah. that's mostly what I remember. <laughs> that and the rap. I totally forgot that there's a plot. Yeah, that that is the thing about uh, in the hood and back to the hood. The leprechaun smokes weed. It, like he, he smokes a joint with iced tea and leprechaun in the hood. Then he smokes a bong in <laughs> leprechaun back to the hood. Then he stabs the guy with the bong. Lep um in the hood. Lep in the hood. The main characters are um are the this is this rap duo, and one of them is like trying to be all hard gangster, and he calls himself so it's a trio. Bullet. I think it's a is trio. it a trio? Okay, I only I only remember the two, but one uh, one of them calls himself Stray Bullet, and then the other guy who's trying to be like the positive rapper, he calls himself Postmaster P because he delivers a positive message. <laughs> <laughs> But it's just such a dichotomy because they're trying to be these gangster rappers, but <laughs> but but there's they're always arguing over what kind of message they want to send. I I was not expecting this recording of this episode to make me want to marathon the Leprechaun movies, but but anyway, that that was one of the that the franchises that just kind of took it to to the to the hood to the city. Uh, what do you guys got? What are some of your favorites? Uh, well. Uh... You know, uh, back to, you know, change of locations. Uh, the first one that kind of came to mind for me was uh, Critters 3 with uh, Oscar winner Leonardo DiCaprio. Because, yeah, it's a similar thing where it's like, you know, uh, Critters 1, pretty much all on one farm. And Critters 2 spreads out to the rest of the town in, in Grover's Mill. So, you know, I had to move up from there. So Critters 3, uh, it's like some Kreitz... Uh, Crate eggs uh, uh, sneak on or, or get snuck on uh, this truck that goes to the city. So you basically got a bunch of critters on the loose in a high rise apartment and trapping everybody inside. I also haven't watched the critter franchise either. So I have some marathons coming up, I guess. But that sounds awesome. Yeah, no, it's 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 fun. Uh, and yeah. No, and again, it's just the novelty of watching a young Leonardo DiCaprio getting attacked by critters and yeah and it's like and yeah it is kind of like evil dead rise where it's not like a fancy high-rise apartment it's kind of a uh you know just kind of a run-down apartment with like these uh, uh people struggling to survive and now they gotta struggle to survive against uh critters who are like chasing them up and down uh the complex and, yeah it has its moments like i, I do like yeah, there's like a funny scene where uh, it's kind of this Tom and Jerry bit where like this older woman is trying to kill the critters that are in her kitchen with a big uh, like cleaver or, or kind of like in Gremlins when the mom tries to find them off. And yeah, and it's, it kind of turns into like a diehard thing where they got to make their way to the roof. Yeah, so critters in a high rise in L.A. Go figure. Oh, God. Uh, most most of the examples I came up with uh we're, we're exactly rural to, to urban settings. Most were suburbia to uh, uh, city settings, but there's there's one that like I think we're all thinking of, and we'll, we'll get to it with a with a certain <laughs> special effects guy. There's um, an mm-hmm. obvious one. Yeah, oh, well, yeah. There, there's a couple, but what, a couple that I wanted to bring up: uh, Hellraiser three. Oh you, yeah, you tend to not think of Hellraiser on that, but it did follow a lot of the same trajectory that the Leprechaun, like uh, the '90s thing, where it's like, okay, now it's a rural thing or it's a suburban thing. Now we're going to put it in the city, or now we're going to go into space. Hellraiser did all that too, but Hellraiser three was such a such a shift because, like, it's again the first two movies, like the second one, you know, we went to hell, obviously, but like so much of it was like that. What's behind the walls of that suburban house, the perfect perfect house? There's you're not thinking there's a skinless dude up in the attic trying to fuck everybody, you know? Uh, and then the third one just went fucking ridiculous and turning all the Cenobites into Robocop Terminators uh, with a leather fetish, you know? Um, but yeah, uh, not saying that that's a great example. Uh, Hell on Earth, it, it's, 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 it's a, it's a fun watch, but it is not Hellraiser one or two. Um, it's, it's very different. Uh, and I think and I think the urban setting uh, helps with that because there's a lot more like running around, a lot more ridiculousness happened. But again, I think it's the, just the entire shift on like what the Cenobites are uh, is what led to a lot of that, not just the setting. I know that you just binged through all of the Hellraisers, but you also just went through all of the Children of the Corn, didn't you? Don't they go to urban at one point? That was the one I was referring to. 
Yeah, that's why I want. That's why I wanted to do Hellraiser first because I was like, I I feel like people want me to talk about Urban Harvest because I did do the the one through six, and I only made it to four with Hellraiser because uh, after four I was just like I was I was tired. I was they get tired. rough. Um, not not that it was not as bad as doing Children of the Corn one through three and then working six through four. Uh, that was rough. That was that. Was, that one was a okay. Like I my my brain needs a reset. But yes, Urban Harvest, the best of the Children of the Corn sequels, is fucking incredible. The, just them trying to grow a cornfield in like a vacant lot, and there's just like a teenage Charlize Theron in there for you know mm-hmm. why not? She's one of the extras, and also the special effects by Screaming Mad George. Yeah, and there's like a court. The the, the he who walks behind the walls, Screaming Mad, made him like a giant court husker um, bug. Right? Is it wasn't that was like the big inspiration. Uh, that scene is a giant so cool. corn worm bug monster. That's that uh, Children of the Corn Three is such a great example of. Uh, I put it. I put it there with like Amityville Two, where it's just like, all right, cool. We're just gonna go fucking bonkers with this. One. Yeah, like, like we're just gonna throw everything at the wall. It's the American Horror Story Asylum of of those franchises. You know. Did you guys see how in the Fangoria Chainsaw Awards there's a category for best Amityville movie? <laughs> Oh my god, seriously? There actually were enough Amityville movies last year that they had their own category with five nominees. Um, yeah, man. When you were saying an obvious one, I thought we that you were going to go Jason Goes to Hell because that, or uh, not Jason Goes to Hell, Jason Takes Manhattan because that that's the, the gold standard of an urban setting going, go, or a rural setting going urban. Well, I mean, I think we all can agree that Children of the Corn 3, Urban Harvest, is the actual gold standard of doing it right. <laughs> yeah, but, I, I mean, mean, considering Jason takes Manhattan largely on a boat. Yeah, that's true. I mean, they do spend a little bit. The, I think the best part of uh, Jason goes, uh, Jason takes Manhattan is the teaser. It's a hard one. <laughs> the teaser is, is incredible. Oh, yeah. of Just the skyline in New York, New York, and then he turns Start around. Start spreading the news. Beautiful. Oh, remember when we when we used to make awesome teasers like that or Leatherface three or Leatherface Texas Chainsaw Massacre three with like the Excalibur chainsaw thing or Shining with the with the doors opening and it's just text basically being like Stanley Kubrick is doing a Stephen King novel. So prepare your fucking panties, motherfuckers. Speaking of Stephen King, the teaser for Maximum Overdrive. Oh, when he's coked out, he's like, I'm going to scare the shit out of you. And it's like, you already did. You already did. (laughs) He's all coked out. <laughs> he was, you could see the cloud of cocaine around him. It was a dark time for men. Oh, Steve, I'm glad he lived through it, though, because he's got he he definitely uh, <laughs> has put out some outputs since then. Yeah. Um, Scream kind of did the same thing as uh, Jason Takes Manhattan, too, because they I mean, they kind of played around suburbia. They went to Hollywood for number three, which, you know, is kind of suburbia. Um but when they finally went to New York, I think they did it better than Jason Takes Manhattan. Though Scream in New York was was awesome. Yeah, no, like the bodega scene. I still think about that. The Ooh. subway scene. Oh, that too. That was a good. Yeah. One. Also, uh, wait, hold, hold. I'm sorry. This just registered in my head. You said that L.A. isn't a city that that's basically mm-hmm. like suburbia. <laughs> Go fuck yourself, San Diego. <laughs> San Diego, is a, uh, San Diego is a, a, su- a suburb, too. No, I, I'm just saying L.A. <laughs> you don't think of L.A. as being urban. There's like maybe a, a 10 block radius that is urban and the rest of it is. That's that's like downtown. That's like yeah. city city. Well, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. cities like the sky skyscrapers. We are. Yeah. We are. All, we are pretty spread out. Uh, I'll, I'll give you that. But we are a city. And, and when you do movies about it, a lot of times they say L.A. and then they'll focus in on like a suburban house, you know, yeah, that's because those movies are focusing on white people. Um, <laughs> but yeah, fair enough. Um, I think I think we're are we living in the gold golden age of go, uh, urbanization of horror franchises, though, because like we're kind of back to back with Scream 6 being like really fucking good in New York and then. On the other side of the country, Evil Dead Rise in L.A. Now, well, that actually brings me to a question I want to ask you guys. Why do you think horror franchises kind of 
not necessarily feel the need, but why do you think it's so effective that they do that? It's like, it's kind of like going to space. Eventually they yeah, got to go well, to space. It's, uh, it's simple, really. It's all about escalation. You know, like the best sequels are the ones that uh, take everything that worked in the first movie and build them up even larger. And usually, you know, that also applies to setting, you know, like if it's a, in a house, you set it in a bigger house and with more people. So uh, it only makes sense that if you want to kind of build up on a story like that you go from like a house or a cabin to a high rise or you know like a big apartment complex uh also similarly with uh demons to demons 2 uh because yeah in demons you know that was just in a movie theater then demons 2 it was a whole uh like apartment complex that is true. You do need more bantha fodder. And how many people can you convince to go to a <laughs> derelict cabin in the middle of a fucking field? Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Although that would be funny if they tried to do a sequel where it's the same setting, but like uh, a lot more people. So they just stuff like 30 people inside of one cabin. Right. So you need to go bigger. And what better example of a sequel going harder, bigger, better and just having things turn into random ass things than Gremlins 2, the new batch. Oh, yeah. The ultimate of suburban <laughs> to <laughs> urban settings. Like, I mean, come on. That's gold. St- we said Urban Harvest was gold standard. How dare I? How <laughs> dare I say such yeah, things? Yeah, no, Clamp Tower. Ugh. What God. a. Yeah, that's that. But it but it is true. I, I do think it is the the going bigger, having the bigger setting, having more people for Bantha fodder. You know, uh, that's that was a lo- a big thing with like uh, Hellraiser three hell on earth, because there wasn't a lot of like wasn't a lot of bodies. You know, there was there wasn't a high body count in those first few. And then the third one, you just had Cenobites throwing fucking CDs at people's faces and, and killing them. So, like, you know, you can't do that in a suburban house. I think what it is. At least in the case of Friday the 13th, it was absolutely they were trying to break the mold of what those movies were because they did seven of them at the summer camp. And I think maybe Evil Dead might have been doing that, too, because, you know, they I think they got all they could out of the creepy cabin. So they were kind of trying to break the mold. And and also with Ash versus Evil Dead, that kind of helped usher that in. Um, But they're they're basically trying to tell the audience, hey, you can't expect you know, you don't know what to expect. You can't expect us to stay in this creepy cabin yeah. because we found a way to take it to this apartment building. Well, and that's what Lee Cronin said uh, in an interview when he said that he was he knew he was going to meet with Sam Raimi. And he's like, all right, if Sam Raimi offers me another cabin in the woods, Evil Dead, I will you know, tell him, listen, I can't wait to see that movie as a fan, but I can't make another cabin in the woods, Evil Dead. And they went, yeah, we don't want to either. So it was like, oh, cool. And then that's where we get the. The shift in location, but I mean, it it, it really can be some of the best sequels in a free in a franchise, especially when you get because we're mainly talking about franchises that are like get to like eight or ten movies deep. But I think one of the best sequels uh, that goes urban is Poltergeist three, because oh, yeah, first two, yeah, that's another great example. Those two are just mainly in cities. And then Poltergeist three has, that was kinder trauma for me, especially the parking lot scene where they're, when the guy's running and all of a sudden he just into the ground. Oh yeah. And the mirrors, the mirrors in the elevator. Yeah. There, there's, there's a lot that you can play with and, and taking what you have, like the rules you have are like, okay, so if ghosts can fuck around with chairs, how will they do in an elevator that's filled with mirrors, you know? <laughs> Exactly. And also, I st- and, uh, you know, I still love uh, Poltergeist 3 because on a, you know, on effects level, uh, like all the, I think it was almost 100% in camera effects. So like everything you're seeing, it's like all sleight of hand and like making use of the environments of the uh, of the skyscraper. So it's it, it still looks amazing. I uh, I have two questions. First, uh, what franchise do you guys want to see go uh to the city take a take a little field trip get out of there that hasn't already i i've got one i want to see tremors in the city yeah Ooh. all right because they went to like the arctic you know they did like the glacier thing but other than that they've just kind of stayed in the desert yeah, they, well they've gone to islands like there well was... yeah yeah they went to that island that one time but yeah i want to see uh i want to see graboids take over a city 
It would fuck up the foundation of a lot of buildings. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, I got one. Uh, I want to see the Texas Chainsaw Massacre go uh, to the big city, which funny enough, that was a pitch by um, Bill Mosley years ago. He had an idea where uh, the Sawyers moved to New York City and open up a fancy uh, restaurant where you know, they're using people as the main ingredient, but they're a huge hit. So I just would love to see the Sawyers kind of do a Beverly Hillbillies type thing and go from rags to riches. I'm so sad we don't have that movie. <laughs> Me too. It would have been so much fun. Uh, man, I, I'm having a hard time coming up with one off the top of my head because my head's just going Jaws. I want to see Jaws in the city, but... We kind of we kind of got that a little bit with the Jaws 3D because they had them in like a Sea World type yeah. environment, you know, yeah. or uh, you know, just set in the mainland, like off the coast of Boston, I guess. Yeah, but even still, like it's it's not in the city. You got it's got to stay in water. Sharks, yeah, you know? Our, uh, Jaws goes into the Charles River. Charles River. There's a shark in the river. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, what's a franchise you guys think would just flat out not work in a city? Because off the top of my head, Nightmare on Elm Street. I know, you know, there's that threat at the end of Freddy's Day. There's an Elm Street in every town. Every town has an Elm Street. Yeah, but I I, I don't know how effective. It's a hurdle. That's a hurdle. Yeah, because, I mean, it's dream, so, you know, it doesn't really, um, you know, make that much of a difference, I guess. Just picturing Freddy running around like a like a subway. It's just silly. You know? yeah. The, and not yeah, I'm just not really sure where you go with that. Yeah. Let's see. I guess for me, it'd probably be like Halloween. Like I just can't really see Michael Myers in the big city, or you know, if he was in the big city, it's like what what do you do with that? It's the same with Nightmare on Elm Street. You can't really take it away from Elm Street. You know. Yeah. Is that is Haddonfield? He Haddonfield is is his spot exactly. Or <laughs> Michael Myers takes Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> it's a deep dish. Uh, I mean, like, even the paranormal activity, they had that Japanese uh, spinoff, Tokyo Nights, you know, so that that one went urban. Um, but even then, those those ones mostly take place in like a house or like, you know, it's not you're not seeing like, oh, I also well, also marked ones was in L.A. too. Oh, oh, I got I wait, I got one. Uh, the Blair Witch Project. <laughs> yeah, that, that wouldn't work in the city. No, yeah, you, can, you can't do the Blair Witch Project in like Baltimore. Any Bigfoot movie, although I would pay to see a Bigfoot movie in the city. Urban Bigfoot, <laughs> like a Harry and the Hendersons type in in the city. I just don't think crypt, American cryptids would work in 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 city areas. Like, could you imagine a bunch of like melon heads like running around New York? People would just be like, "All right, those those are some weird fucks," uh, and then move on with their day. Because I think that's part of the aloofness of a lot of these like weirdness that you would see in these rural areas. It just New York or city folk would just either not be phased or they were just so ingrained to not look at it that we just wouldn't care. Are we missing any, any big ones? Well, I guess not, not exactly the same, but uh, there, there've been a lot of movies where like Dracula goes to the big city. Yeah. But vampires in the city is cool. Cause especially like blade. Oh yeah, no, you're, you're right. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> Vampires in the cities is dope. I mean, it, okay, well, no, I, got, I got confused because I, I it was just like referring in general, but yeah, like stuff that doesn't work. Uh, we know that Predator went to the city for Predator Two. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I didn't oh, mention damn. Predator Two. Oh damn, we forgot Predator <laughs> Two. Jesus. Yeah, I I love that though. From one jungle to the urban jungle. Yes. <laughs> Taglines were wild for that one. So I think this episode we're establishing that if your franchise is not is running a little bit out of steam or you're looking to shake things up a bit, then you got to take it to the city because we're, <laughs> we have listed off some of the best sequels in these franchises. I got to say though, like moving to the big city. So are you saying that predator was running out of steam after one movie? <laughs> well, no, they needed to change it up because you can't just do another movie, a bunch of, about a bunch of muscle muscle bros in the, in the, in the jungle. Yeah. You know, you had to, you had to change it drastically. And also Danny Glover was fucking badass in predator too. I, I, yep. And bring this full circle, Gary Busey and Gary Busey. <laughs> yes. Hider in the LA from the predator. You know what I want to see? I just thought of this. I want to see, an Expendables movie that becomes a stealth Predator movie. 
Uh, there's an idea. Although Ooh. that was kind of the that was kind of Predators. I was gonna uh, say that. Well, also Predator was kind of that way too because you had Jesse the Body and uh, um and Schwarzenegger and uh, and what's his head Carl Weather. I mean, you had yeah. all of these action stars, so it would be a modern Predator, I guess. I mean, you did have Terminator with Action Jackson and uh, God. Why don't I remember Jesse Ventura's name in Running Man? Uh, <laughs> what was he? Take Electro my car. or Captain something. Ah, uh, hold on a second. I feel like I have not only disappointed our fans, but I've disappointed myself more so. I'm disappointing remember. myself because what was the hockey guy's name in Running Man? Um, Sub Zero. Sub Zero. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Ca- oh, Jesse Ventura was Captain Freedom. That's what it was, Captain Freedom. Uh, yeah, it's hockey guy. I think was uh, Sub Zero. Yeah, he and- was Sub Zero. And there was a and there's another guy, Buzzsaw, and there was another guy named Fireball. And you had the writer of Lethal Weapon in there too, Shane Black. Shane so, Black. Oh, yep. yeah, it kind yeah. of was the Expendables. It kind of Expendables. it was the Expendables of its day. Yeah. yeah. There you yeah. go. Fighting uh and and actually the Predator was supposed to be Jean-Claude Van Damme. Yeah, but that that costume would did not Didn't work. work. <laughs> I'm so glad they they decided against that. And yeah, Van Damme no. was also in his not cool attitude era. Can you imagine how different the landscape of like of, of creature features would be if they didn't do the predator the way that they did. Oh, man. I mean, cause it's so iconic and it yeah. went on to do a- alien versus predator. I mean, that they, there probably wouldn't even have been a second movie, honestly, yeah. but okay, cool. Well, let's, uh, let's wrap this one up. What did we miss? I feel like we are missing some, but, uh, it, what are your favorite franchises that have, uh, that have gone to the hood or gone, uh, gone urban? Um, what have we missed? Um, and was it too soon for Predator to go to go urban? No, and no. Predator Two is a masterpiece. <laughs> I will fight. And yeah. and did Friday the Thirteenth wait too long to go urban? <laughs> well, in the movie it did. Yeah, in the movie it and, did. And also the, the fact movies. that they weren't able to go to all the big locations they wanted to, and you know had to cut the budget. In the movie itself, it waited too long. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> let us know what you think of these urban settings, and uh, and also chime in on on what who you want to see go urban do you want to see shark to puss go urban or <laughs> you know uh w- what sharknado go urban i am trying to think of like franchises that are going on right now yeah well the purge kind of went urban after this the first movie because the, the, the first one was like suburban and then yeah. it took it into the city which was kind of cool but and it hasn't left since <laughs> no no <laughs> well well like it did kind of for um forever purge it that's went true yeah uh, they, they were in austin yeah yeah, that's yeah they they went to and, and it was like on a ranch so it was close enough to mexico that they could make a run for mexico when they didn't call it <laughs> off which was right. really ironic all right so faithful listeners let us know what you guys think and um we'll uh we'll call this an episode uh you can find us at, on any of the socials at ion horror or at ihorror.com uh because that's the site we call home uh our music is by restless spirits so go give them a listen and our artwork is by chris fisher so go give him a like and uh yeah i'm gonna go uh, i'm gonna go hit the city right now yeah <laughs> so we'll, <laughs> hey, now what if the warriors went the other way and went rural Ooh. Oh. <laughs> oh man <laughs> that's a that's a different episode <laughs> isn't that oh, just lord of the rings the hills have warriors <laughs> like the hills, hills have, have eyes, eyes. Guys. yeah that's a franchise that could go to the city <laughs> oh that would be that would be really freaky yeah wrong oh, turn they could take those guys to the city oh geez uh, any of these deliverance to the city yeah, like I said, you know, it's, it's, it's like they did with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's like the uh, Beverly Hellbillies. <laughs> All right. With that, let's get out of here. So we'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. So for me, James J. Edwards. I'm Jacob Davison. And I'm Jonathan Korea. Keep your eye on horror.